and zero waste department. Got that. Sorry. Um, works at no worries. Works with youth on zero waste project with special focus in the last few years after uh, releasing Microplastic Madness, the film that came out in 2019, with special focus on getting single use plastics out of school cafeterias. Uh, cafeteria Culture was founded in um, about 13 years ago uh, as Styrofoam Out of Schools and is responsible for the elimination of single use styrofoam cafeteria trays from the New York City school system. No mean feat. This is the largest school system in the country, now approaching almost 1,800 schools. Um, so this styrofoam action led to the uh, New York City uh, ban on styrofoam containers that happened in 2019. That then led to the uh, state ban on styrofoam, which happened just this year. So let's begin. Let's see here. Okay. Great. So let's get started. Plastic is a hazardous substance. Uh, first exposes us to thousands of toxic chemicals, toxic exposures, and then exposes us to toxic and damaging micro and nanoplastic particles. Uh, we will breathe in about a million of those particles during the course of this teaching. Get some context. You guys are familiar with these photographs. We produce an unimaginable amount of plastic, 400 million metric tons each year. But the good news, most of that is single-use packaging and food, footwear, food, foodwear. So it's non-essential and substitutable plastic. And there's an opportunity there to really make a dent in plastic production. We'll talk about that later. And also, as you probably know, the United States is the number one plastic waste producer in the world. We're number one. Um, and so what happens to all that plastic? Um, in the classic 2017 uh, study, this is considered the gold standard referred to by all microplastic um, scientists. The Geyer, Jembeck, and Lavender Law uh, attempted to determine where all this plastic is. We know it's not biodegradable, so where to go? Um, approximately 9% is recycled, has been recycled. This is all uh, plastic ever made. 9% has been recycled, and we'll look more closely at that um, a little bit later. 12% has been incinerated, and all the rest, 79% has been either landfilled or lost to the environment, soil, air, and water. And no one can give us data as to how much has gone into landfill and how much has actually gone to the environment. Uh, so what is plastic? I like to say it's a group project. It's a collaboration between the two most huge, powerful industries in the world. Uh, so we know the fossil fuel industry, the most powerful industry in the world. We know them well, BP, Exxon, Mobil, Shell, and others. And then we have Big Chemical. That is the second most powerful industry in the world. Uh, industry leaders, Dow and DuPont. We don't often think about Big Chemical because we don't buy our products directly from Big Chemical. Um, Instead, Big Chemical synthesizes, that's its business, making new chemicals every day, selling those chemicals to other producers that incorporate them into products. So you want to think cleaning chemicals, pesticides, fertilizers. Um, so if you're Big Chemical, how do you make money from this business model? Well, you have to make, you have to keep making and synthesizing brand new chemicals. And the more you make, the more your chemists make, the more money you make. These are newly synthesized chemicals. They didn't exist on earth until they were created in a laboratory somewhere. Scientists call them novel entities. <clears throat> so let's take a look at this graph. It tracks the production of novel entities since the year 2000. Um, so the point of this graph is um, it, it starts at the year 2000, gave it a baseline of one. You can see that from the vertical axis and it wants to, um, count all the chemical production since that time. And you can see that it's on a trajectory and it did double by 2020, although at the time that this uh, study was done, it only got to 2017. So that's a creation, that's the production of novel entities. Uh, but what's interesting about this graph is the orange line just underneath it. That's the production of novel entities, newly synthesized chemicals that were produced to be used in plastics. 
So what this graph tells us is that plastic production is driving chemical production. And the scientists that did this review and accounting of chemicals uh, concluded that the planet cannot absorb the current number and amount of newly synthesized chemicals. According to the EU, a new chemical is created every 1.4 seconds. So in response to this uh, chemical problem, the EU announced in April of this year what it calls a restrictions roadmap. It's a plan. It's a plan to ban tens of thousands of these chemicals. The US, no plan. Uh, don't get your hopes up. We're not likely to see one. Why our regulatory system is broken. Our regulatory framework, unlike the Europeans, requires studies and lots of them. Years and years of studies because our scientists are required to uh, take chemical by chemical and establish a quantitative risk threshold that shows that exposure to that chemical is greater for um, the risk of getting some specific disease is greater for people exposed to the chemicals than not exposed to the chemical. You can imagine how hard this is given the limitations on experimenting in humans, all the variables and the constant exposure that we all get from the chemicals around us. Meanwhile, big chemicals cranking out a new chemical every 1.4 seconds. So the plastic industry would prefer that you not know about these things because plastic is a hazardous substance replete with thousands of these chemicals, but it's too late. That horse is out of the barn. In the last several years, scientists have developed new instruments and new computer technology technologies that detect novel entities and they can actually identify and visualize micro and nano plastic particles. So that's why we're seeing this recent, I'd say probably in the last two years, this outpouring of plastic studies and alarming headlines about plastic. So what can big plastic do? Well, it will muddy the picture. It's going to churn out misinformation. It wants to create doubt. And I'm hoping that after uh, this teach-in, there will be no doubt in your mind and you'll be able to see clearly through the messaging that's coming from these big um, multinational industries. So the plastic industry does its messaging through the, uh, their industry spokes, uh, uh, the trade group, uh, the American Chemistry Council, also known as ACC. Now, you know, where I went to school, big basketball schools in North Carolina, ACC, Maine's Atlantic Coast Conference. But so now you remember ACC here that we got American Chemistry Council. Every article, I can guarantee almost every article you read on about plastic from the mainstream press will have quotations from ACC, from American Chemistry Council. So I just want you to look for those and just know they're outright lying. It, you know, not afraid to say the L word. Um, so let's look at some of their messaging. Uh, this is one that I've heard a lot lately, plastic is inert. Um, so what does inert mean? It means plastic is chemically inactive. It's harmless. I hope after my talk today, you'll know that it is impossible. Um, next one, this is an oldie. Uh, plastic keeps food safe and sanitary. We, they hauled that one out and got big play during COVID, but there's no basis in science for that. We know that COVID is a respiratory virus. It's transmitted through aerosol droplets. It's technically possible to get COVID by touching something that an infected person coughed on. But it's very difficult. And the studies that have been done, and this is all up on the CDC website, show that the virus actually lives longer on plastic a non-porous material than on porous materials such as food. Uh, I just want to take a mention on the fresh, plastic keeps food fresh. This is something that is relied upon by big food and big egg. They make, they pre-process, they of course make foods in mass quantities. It's industrial farming and ship long distances and they couldn't do that without plastic. Now I love this one. We can make plastic safer. I've heard that one a lot too, but think about it. How can plastic be inert and at the same time there be a need to make it safer? So these are two contradictory messages and you'll see them sometimes in the same article. Um, it's okay that plastic is in our bodies and the implication is there is because it's inert. And, um, or we haven't proved yet, this, this is gonna be big. We haven't proved yet that it can harm our bodies. We haven't done all the studies. And so, you know, the plastic industry is on firm ground here because of our regulatory model, which does require us as the in the public interest to prove that harm, which will take us years to do. 
if not decades. Um, and then in a recent National Geographic article about plastic, I actually saw it's too complicated, it's too controversial, which that was bizarre. And then the ever popular, we need more recycling, and we'll talk about that. <clears throat> So let's begin. Plastic is a hazardous subject, a substance, and that is my message. What does it mean? Um, two pathways to harm. We're going to start first with chemical exposures. In order to understand this, we got to understand what plastic is. So plastic is two ingredients, fossil fuels plus chemicals. Let's start with the fossil fuels. So uh, fossil fuels come in, I like to say, three states of, states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas, coal, oil, and natural gas. But most plastics are made from oil and natural gas. At the molecular level, all of these fossil fuels are what we call hydrocarbon. What is a hydrocarbon? It's a molecule with only hydrogen and carbon atoms, you may remember from your chemistry classes. Um, they're named according to how many carbons they contain, and they're organized in a specific way. You can see from these three sample molecules that they have a carbon backbone. Carbon can bind four atoms, and so the empty bonding spaces are taken up by hydrogen. Hydrocarbon chemistry is actually really fun. Um, so the other thing about hydrocarbon is that a fuel that combusts in the presence of oxygen. So here's your classic combustion reaction. You may remember also from chemistry on the left, we have our reactants, methane plus two oxygen molecules, and the reaction goes forward with a little heat, and we get that unintended and unwanted byproduct CO2, some uh, water, and then we get, we get that energy, heat, and light, and that's the whole reason we engage in these um, combustion chemistry reactions. So, okay, now we get some hydrocarbons. How do we make that into plastic? So let's make some plastic. We're going to start with this monomer. It's called a monomer. This is ethane. You might recognize it from the previous slide, two carbon monomer called ethane. I want you to think of it as like a bead on a necklace. So we're going to string a bunch of these ethane molecules all together, and we're going to link them with chemical processes in a big, dirty, heavily polluting refinery industrial complex, which is what happens. Not pretty like a necklace, unfortunately. And we're going to get from our ethane a polymer. We're going to get ethylene, a polyethylene. So we can make our polymers from ethane, our two carbon molecules, and we get polyethylene. You may recognize these plastic polymers, uh, the, the high density polyethylene ethylene and the low density polyethylene. And we can also make our polymer from propane, the three carbon monomer. But you know, this is the industry secret. We cannot make any plastic products with just the polymer. That's just a goopy mess. In order to make a product, we have to add chemicals. In the industry, it calls it chemical additives. I think that's really deceptive. When I first heard the term chemical additive, I thought it was like a little something dripped into the big polymer mess, but it's not. Uh, the polymers uh, form a bulk of the product. And so, and we're not just adding a few chemicals in order to get our product, we're adding thousands of them. And why do we do that? Oh, to give plastic its miracle properties, the ones we've come to expect from our plastic. So let's take a look. We now know there's at least 10,000 chemicals in plastics. There are so many chemicals now that scientists group them into two groups. The first is the intentionally added substances, and those are the substances that are part of the product design. They are ingredients in the recipe. And then, lo and behold, we get the surprise chemicals we get the non-intentionally added substances. These are substances that form unexpectedly during the production process or after the product is formed. So you bring the product home and meanwhile, it's creating new chemicals. Um, non-intentionally added substances are thought to result from interactions between the chemicals that are already in the product, interactions between the chemicals in the product and outside forces like heat and light, and what is called degradation products, just as the product ages, the chemicals start to break down and form new chemicals. So let's return to uh, the intentionally added substances. You can see, voila, we have all kinds of miracle properties. I like to uh, break the plasticizers into aesthetic. They make, they take a dirty old hydrocarbon and turn it into something pretty. Uh, we have our functional plasticizers, you know, we need plastic that's strong and rigid, we need soft plastics, we need it to do all kinds of things. We have our miracle plastic coatings that we're going to take a look at. 
a little closer. We have flame retardants. Remember that uh, these plastics are made from fossil fuels, which are highly combustible. So every plastic product must have a flame retardant. Um, there's heat and antioxidants, but I particular attention to the processing age, aids. These are thousands of chemicals that are added for the sole purpose of producing uh, plastic cheaply and easily, mass quantities. So what's wrong with these chemicals, right? They do these great things, they make our plastic pretty. Well, here's the problem. They are all either persistent organic pollutants or heavy metals. Let's start with the persistent organic pollutant that uh, we, for short, we call them POPs. So these are persistent chemicals. They don't break down in the environment and we can't get them out of our bodies either. And the reason is that they're oily. So, you know, oil and water don't mix. You've tried to clean off a greasy uh, skillet in your sink after cooking something oily and, and the water does nothing to the oil. Same thing happens in our body. Our elimination processes are water-based. We pee and poop, those are water-based. We can't get these things out of our body. Um, and that's also why they don't break down in the environment. But if you'll notice from the picture, the interesting thing that happens is that water can carry these uh, chemicals everywhere because they basically float on the top. Water serves as a carrier for persistent organic pollutants. Um, these, they are organic, which in chemistry world simply means they contain at least one carbon atom and they are pollutants. They are introduced into the environment in a non-naturally occurring way that's harmful to life. So the thing about POPs is that they bioaccumulate and biomagnify, two terms that are often confusing. So I hope I can clarify that. Uh, bioaccumulation occurs in a single person or animal or a single individual and occurs over a long period of time. So the blue fish here is meant to represent the same fish over a long period of time, slowly accumulating POPs in its body. Uh, biomagnification does not occur over time. We're talking about a snapshot in time. We're looking at a food chain and we're just gonna sample different levels of the food chain on, at one moment for uh, quantities of pollutants. So the prey, of course, is gonna have the lowest level of pollutants. Predator one, because it eats a lot of the prey, is gonna have a higher level of pollutant and so on up the food chain. The pollutants will uh, be biomagnifying. So this happens in people too, right? So you can remember bio and accumulate. Hopefully you'll be not get mixed up now. And uh, they don't just bioaccumulate, right? I mean, where do we put them? Uh, well, they're stored in fatty tissues. Should be no surprise to you now, now that you know they're oily and there's that rule in chemistry, like attracts like means polar uh, substances attract other polar oily substances attract oily. So uh, these chemicals get stored in our fatty tissues and they don't just sit there, they begin to interfere with cell function and bodily systems. And this, I just wanna kind of give you an idea so you can visualize how this might happen. So when POPs enter the body, they cause trouble and they're oily. And so they gravitate to cell membranes, which as you may remember from biology, is lipid protein structures that form that envelope around the cells. Uh, some membranes are really important. They control what goes in and out of the cell. And these cell membranes hold out cell receptors that act like switches. So in my little uh, artwork here, the cell receptor uh, looks like that black Y that's sticking up out of the blue membrane. And then here's some just three examples of how POPs cause trouble. Bind in this receptor, switch something off or on in the cell, uh, compete or block access to the receptor, another um, naturally occurring um, molecule in our body may want to get into that or need to get into that receptor to do something important and now can't. Um, and then POPs can trick the cell into opening the door and letting them in. And then when POPs get into the cells, trouble. Right, so they go right for the organelles. You may remember this from biology too. These are lipid protein structures inside the cell and they perform jobs for the cell. Each organelle has a specific job and POPs interfere with these jobs. So you can imagine what might happen if the cell's not able to make protein, produce energy, regulates metabolism, or read the instructions for how it's supposed to operate. And when this happens, we get whole body system malfunction. So our body is in some ways like a machine. Everything's finely tuned and so many, um, it, it just finely tuned. Um, and so what do I mean by systems? 
Um, and here's some an example of what I mean by systems, nervous system, immune system, endocrine system, and so on. Let's take a closer look at the endocrine system. So endocrine is just a fancy name for hormones. And what are hormones? Well, they're lipid protein molecules, again, that travel around the body and it and they coordinate bodily functions. They tell our cells what to do, switch things off and on. And uh, we have over 200 of them in our body. In the uh, chart here, just a sample of hormones, where they're produced, what, what gland or tissue produces that hormone, where that gland or tissue is located, and then what the hormone does. This is just a sampling. These are POPs that in particularly target the endocrine uh, system, those, uh, these chemicals, these, this is the subclass of the larger class of POPs, they mimic or um, uh, uh, imitate um, hormones, they block hormones or otherwise interfere with them. And so as you can imagine, we get system-wide, again, system-wide malfunction, um, and this is what that looks like. Um, in the reproductive system, I'll just point out a few things that POPs uh, mimic or imitate estrogen. So they can cause estrogen-like effects in our body. They also block androgens like testosterone. And there, here's our, some of the, here are some of the effects. I really want to focus, uh, uh, direct your attention to metabolism and appetite. Um, we now know that POPs are obesogens. Um, and they interfere with several hormones that regulate uh, metabolism, the way we burn energy and the way we store fat. And then also the neurologic system effects, extremely concerning. So uh, we, I told you that we've now learned that uh, plastics made of two things, persistent organic pollutants and, um, or the, the, the chemicals, plastic chemicals consist of persistent organic pollutants uh, or heavy metals. We talked about the POPs. So what's a heavy metal? So you may remember, again, from your chemistry, it's the technical definition is that it's a metal that comes from a, like the middle area on the periodic table. It's a metal with high density. Uh, it means they're really heavy. The molecules are packed really close together and it's toxic. Um, and then um, also some of them have, many of them have high, high atomic numbers and high atomic weights, but not all of them. Uh, these are the four most common heavy metals that are used in making plastic. And so why are we even using these, right? We know they're neurotoxins. Well, they're used for a lot of different functions. They soften plastic, they add color, and they catalyze or kickstart the other chemical reactions that are needed for plastic to make plastic. So um, we've now learned about the uh, all the chemicals in plastic. And so what happens to these chemicals? The industry says they're inert. So let's see. I'd like to introduce you to what I call the water bottle study. People who know me will say, ah, oh, rolling their eyes again with the water bottle study. So um, Ben, I was particularly thinking about you, um, how many call, uh, calls I've been in where I'm bringing up the water bottle study. This is a May 2022 study from Denmark. The investigators tested reusable. Um, we don't know which brands. They describe them as very popular. That's the squeezy um, sport reusable water bottles. They actually tested three different models, but two of each kind. And you can see that they tested new and used one and they used glass bottles for the control. And they did a really simple experiment. They just filled up these bottles with room temperature, ordinary tap water and let it sit for 24 hours. And then they tested the water inside the bottles and they found 400 plastic chemicals. Then they did step two, what you would do with a reusable plastic product, you're going to have to wash it every once in a while. So they stuck all the bottles in the home dishwasher, regular home dishwasher soap. And then uh, after the cycle was over, they removed the bottles and rinsed them out really, really well. And then they repeated the, the experiment with room temperature tap water 24 hours. This time they got 3,500 chemicals. So what do we learn? What did they find? What the, the scientists find? They found the intentionally added chemicals that we've already discussed, the plasticizers and so on. And they found non-intentionally added chemicals. Um, and uh, most prominently and most notably, DEET. <clears throat> um, they also found some soap uh, dishwasher soap that had held on, that had latched onto the plastic bottles 
but not the glass bottles, which I thought was really interesting. So should you want me to comment on the DEET? Do you all know what it is? Um, I don't know if DEET's used as popularly as it was when I was younger, but it's basically a pesticide that you slather all over your body so you can go camping or hiking or um, just have an experience in the outdoors with get, without getting eaten by mosquitoes. So it's a mosquito killer uh, repellent, mosquito repellent. Highly toxic. Um, so they were surprised by this and um, not really certain why it appeared. They assumed, and I would hope that it was not an intentionally added chemical. They assumed it was a non-intentionally added chemical that um, resulted from interactions between the existing chemicals, maybe the heat from the dishwasher and the soap. Um, so what we learned from this study is that plastic chemicals leak. This is the take home for the study. They leak fast, right? This is a short contact time, 24 hours. It's not that long. We have food sitting around in plastic and grab and go situations for a lot longer than that. They leaked at room temperature. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I was always kind of thought, well, if you don't heat it, it's okay. No, no, this was room temperature. Probably if they had heated the water, um, there would have been even more chemicals because we know that increases chemical reactions, but even at room temperature. Um, this occurred from new plastic items. It's include, uh, occurred from used plastic items. And there was a leaking of chemicals into a non-lipid, very neutral substance like water. We would uh, expect the number and amount of those chemicals to increase with lipid because it's right, like attracts like, they're oily substances, or maybe something acidic, something that might um, eat in a little bit into the plastic. And then the bottom line, this is a really big, I can't emphasize enough, I want you to remember this. More chemicals leak from weathered plastic items. I'm going to come back to this. So here's the big overview, and um, some of this I'm going to go into a little more detail, but just briefly, uh, and as I said, most plastic chemicals, we don't even know what they are. <laughs> so this is a sampling. This is a few that we actually know about. Let's start with the plasticizers. I just quickly want to say that I call these the revolving door plasticizers. Pla these plasticizers, probably the most stated are bisphenols, you've heard of them, I'm sure, and phthalates. They are considered pseudopops because we actually do eliminate them from our bodies fairly rapidly. You can test your urine. If I test the urine of myself and everybody else in this room, we will find bisphenols and phthalates. Guarantee you, there will be nobody in this room without bisphenols and phthalates. No matter how clean you think you eat or your environment is, we're going to find them there. So, but what happens is as soon as we eliminate bisphenols and phthalates, they're so ubiquitous in our environment, we just take more of them. So that's why I call them the revolving door. And that's why they're also called everywhere chemicals. The other thing I want to point out is that these bisphenols, are, there's over 200 bisphenols. So uh, we, we have so much attention focused on BPA. That's a drop in the bucket. We have over 30 phthalates. There may be more. I couldn't even find good data on how many phthalates there are. So even though we consider them pseudopops, they do have pop-like health harms. They do everything that the, the non-pseudopops do. Then quickly, plastic coatings. These are your forever chemicals. We'll talk more about them. These are slippery, slippery, shiny, non-stick chemicals. And you know, I really like the fact that once you kind of know what the chemical does, you can look at a plastic item now and you can say, oh, I bet this has PFAS in it, right? Because it's got... It, uh, it, uh, it repels water. If I drip some water on this surface, it will it will uh, beat up. So I bet there's PFAS in here. You're probably right. So and then once you know what bisphenols and phthalates, you can look at a plastic item and you say, ah, oh, I bet there's bisphenols in that one. So anyway, the plastic coatings, uh, water and grease resistant. We put it all over paper and uh, fiberboard and uh, but also textiles. And they use it to keep plastic from stick, sticking to the machinery when they're producing plastics. Then there's flame retardants, ubiquitous, right? Because we have a combustible uh, product or uh, component to our product. And then the heavy metals. <clears throat> so what are the routes of entries? How do plastic chemicals get into our bodies? Well, you can imagine eating, drinking, uh, particularly concerned about kids or always thinking of their fingers in their mouth and objects in their mouth. And even my, I have teens and 20 somethings in my house, there's always sticking fingers on the phone screen and then in the mouth. And um, 
and objects in the mouth, even at that age. Uh, also dermal contact, I want you to start thinking about that. That's personal care products. Think about sunscreen that's been sitting in a plastic container for a long time. You know, those chemicals have moved out of the container into the sunscreen. Then we just apply it all over our bodies and it sits there all day long. Cosmetics, same. And then uh, what we uh, respire, these are just the chemicals. We'll talk about the microparticles in a while, but just the chemicals. So it's kind of like lead, what we all learned about lead. When you have a product that's made of lead or plastics, the dust then sits on the plastic, the uh, chemicals transfer to the dust and we breathe them in. And these are some of the most significant impacts um, in youth and children. And I, I personally, well, I'm concerned about all of them. I can't prioritize them, but there's shocking data now about the neurologic uh, impacts. So I just read a study that showed that uh, fire, uh, flame retardants, that um, kids that were exposed to flame retardants in utero have much lower IQ than other kids. And that impact was even more pronounced than with lead exposure. So let's look at quickly at two plasticizers I already mentioned, uh, the uh, bisphenols and the phthalates. And I only bring up bisphenol because this is an example of our broken regulatory tail we've known since 1930, that BPA is an artificial estrogen. You can read here how the EPA is uh, and the um, FDA has just dragged its feet and brought in industry to consult. And then once there's some bad press, the companies voluntarily withdraw only BPA. And then finally, in 2012, after other countries and even some states have banned BPA, the FDA finally bans it, but only in baby bottles and sippy cups. But I do warn you, if you have a small child or a grandchild, um, if it says BPA free means nothing, the industry has substituted. It most likely contains BPS, S, or F. And those are, have been found to be at least as toxic as BPA. In the meantime, the EU and its restrictions road plan states it plans to ban all bisphenols. And that's what's really important about understanding that these chemicals come in large families. <clears throat> okay, plastic coatings, this has generated a lot of press lately. Um, this is all the iterations of the plastic coatings that belong to the family we now kind of call PFAS. Um, they are carbon fluorine molecules. You can see the F in the PFAS, PFOA, PFAS. That's how you know you're dealing with something from the PFAS family. These are the miracle plastic coatings, right? They are waterproof, greaseproof. I tell my kids, you know, why do you think you can drink your coffee out of a paper cup? Well, because there's a plastic coating in there. It's going to be PFAS. Here's the problem. Um, PFAS was created in a laboratory in the 1930s when a chemist bound together a carbon and a fluorine atom. But once bound together, you can never, ever get them apart. The other nightmare is that the industry is cranking out PFAS, despite all these problems, uh, continues to crank out PFAS. Um, You'll commonly see that there's 4,500 PFAS. Uh, there's way more. I think I read recently there's 8,000 PFASs now. I couldn't find that article. Um, so uh, yeah, it's there are a lot of them. <laughs> and this again, the same failed regulatory history. The uh, industry gets a little bad press. I recommend you see the movie Dark Waters if you haven't seen it yet. After Dark Waters. Um, the PFOA and PFAS were voluntarily feasted out and then PFAS came in and then there's been one additional, you know, here's Gen X. They think they can sneak it by us because there's no fluorine in the name of the chemical. <clears throat> then in April 2022, again, Europe announced it's going to ban thousands of PFASs, no more studies needed, and the US EPA is dragging its feet. <clears throat> and then here we go. You want a closed loop? Here's your closed loop. It's the PFASs because these particles never go away and they're just cycled endlessly through our environment. They're introduced into the environment in the form of these products. And then they get into the water and they get into the biosolids that farmers have been using for fertilizers. Only two states have really gone, done good PFAS testing of their soil, Maine and Michigan. They found it everywhere. Contaminated soil, contaminated water, PFAS in the livestock, stock PFAS in the crops. And I'm sure this is true from all, for all states, but um, states aren't testing. And then this map from Environmental Working Group shows water. This is groundwater contamination from industrial discharges and military discharges. <clears throat> 
Okay, so that's our chemical problem, our uh, plastic, our chemical exposures. So what can I do? So let's think about it. Um, here's two products. Both are 14 ounce ketchup products. The one on the left is the glass, and of course the one on the right is the plastic. Let's compare them, and I want you to write in the chat, pretend you know nothing about plastic, and be really honest, you know nothing about plastic, and you had a choice between these two products, which one would you choose? And so please write your choice and why you would make that choice. Remember, be honest, you don't know anything about plastic at this point, or you know very little. And then I want you to think, hmm, what if you're on a tight budget, a really tight budget? Or what if you have no transportation and you can only get to the store on the bus and you've got a bunch of kids to drag along with you? Or maybe you can only walk to the store to get groceries. Um, and then what if you have small children at home that use ketchup a lot, like my kids did, and you just can't get the ketchup out of the dang glass bottle? So I think we know then uh, if you know nothing about plastic, we're all gonna choose the plastic bottle, right? And industry is very clever. They've introduced all these design uh, modifications uh, to make this plastic bottle more appealing and they even made it cheaper too. But knowing what we know about uh, chemicals now that migrate from the bottle into the product, I hope that you would choose the bottle plastic because otherwise this is what you're gonna get. You're gonna get this uh, ketchup, which is actually a hazardous substance. Or, and how about this? What if you know this? You know that uh, this is a plastic bottle, it's gonna end up here. You know what? Unfortunately, I think for a lot of people, it's not enough. It's not enough to make a different decision about the bottle. Maybe you think the bottle's gonna be recycled. So let's, um, We'll talk about that, but let's first look at the, I want to look at the impact of all these 10,000 chemicals on the waste stream. Back to this study. I pen this uh, year just released uh, this study um, that explored, and this is fairly unexplored. We don't even know what these chemicals are. So people are just now beginning to explore their impact on the waste stream. But the, their conclusion was that um, these chemicals lead to uncontrolled exposures, at least with the products, the exposure is controlled. You know where it is, you know it's in that product. This is an uncontrolled exposure risk. So let's look at recycling, what happens. Of course, recycling weathers your plastic. And so what happens with weather plastic? The, the product becomes leakier. If you are able to make, and in some cases you can remake at least partial products, with used plastic. Now you have a product that's a chemical concoction. You don't even know what the heck's in it. It's gonna be extremely leaky and hazardous. How about incineration? What happens to those chemicals during incineration? Well, really they're just changing form from a solid into a gas and then into the ash that goes into a landfill. Hopefully it goes to a hazardous waste landfill. And then what happens to the landfill plastics that are full of chemicals? Well, those we know go to non-hazardous household waste collections and um, they're hazardous. Uh, so those, gonna, uh, those landfill plastics are going to, over time, contaminate the soil and the groundwater and travel long distances and expose us all, as well as other species on the planet. Um, and then, of course, if it's lost to environment, you get basically roaming plastic chemicals and more exposures. So now what can I do after I uh, convince you that you need to change the way you think about plastic? There's some other things you can do and we'll, we'll, we'll get deeper into this, but first realize there are no miracle products. As a matter of fact, I'm so skeptical of miracle products. If I come across a product and it does like fantastic things, I won't buy it because the only way that you can get a product to do fantastic, unimaginable things is to load it up with chemicals. And I want you to start thinking like this. Otherwise, protect your health and the health of people that you love. You probably know a lot of these things. Um, if you have some compostable foodware and you want to know if it contains PFAS, you can contact the Center for Environmental Health and they will test it for you. If you want to switch to uh, reusables, I strongly recommend, and hopefully this will be clear to you now after this talk, don't use plastic reusables. You're going to put them through the washing machine, you're going to get leaky, toxic products. So uh, non-plastic reusables, if you work for a school or a restaurant, you can turn to plasticfreerestaurants.org and they will subsidize the replacements. 
um, plastic free lunch day that's an institutional change for schools. Um, and it's a cafeteria culture product which you can reference on our website. Awesome. And then one thing that it's often not thought about, I want you to think about personal care products that are sitting around in plastic. Um, I mentioned the sunscreen, here's some more. And you know, there's some really cool innovations out there now. You can get bar soap and shampoo, tooth tabs, metal razors. I can get floss and paper and glass. So look around there. This is kind of a burgeoning market and there's a lot happening there. And then legislate. Well, as I just explained, our regulatory model is broken. You're not likely to get any federal action, but I think there is a possibility of getting state action. I know uh, Washington State just passed a fairly aggressive PFAS law. That's chemical exposures. Now we're going to talk about particle damage. So we know that plastics bio not biodegradable, does not biodegrade, but this is worse. It breaks. You think about this. If plastic didn't break, we could go out and pick it all up and collect it. We could clean up after ourselves. But this is horrendous, the fact that it breaks. And it just keeps breaking. First gets into microplastic size. That's five millimeters or less size of a pencil eraser. Um, I recommend our movie, Microplastic Madness, if you haven't seen it. Um, fascinating, but also extremely uplifting and action um, motivating. But then plastic doesn't stop breaking. It doesn't stop with um, microplastic. It then uh, continues breaking into smaller and smaller pieces so that now we have nanoplastic, a, a particle smaller than one micrometer. And I want you to notice we're talking microplastics. We're in millimeter size, but we're by the time you get to nanoplastics, we're in micrometer or micron size, and that's microscopic, right? So um, a red blood cell, if you recognize a red blood cell, uh, the photograph here is a, um, microscopically um, enhanced, uh, is eight micrometers. Nanoplastics are one micrometer or smaller. So what that means is that uh, the largest nanoplastics are one eighth the size of a red blood cell. So what does that mean? Um, when you think about it, first of all, we can't go out and pick them up. Now we're way beyond that point. Um, and uh, the, the thing that's most scary is that this means that they can easily, these nanoplastic particles can easily penetrate our cells. So now, because plastic is fragmented into these tiny particles, we are faced with a near permanent contamination of our water, our air, and our soil. So let's start with water. We find microplastics uh, in bottled water and tap water, how they get there, oh, all kinds of ways. When you see those pictures of macroplastic trash in the water, that's one way. Uh, actually, fishing gear is a huge contributor. Most fishing gear now is made out of plastic. And then there's runoff from land, tire wear particles, talk about that again in a minute, um, all kinds of ways it gets into the water. Groundwater, ocean water, surface water, all water. Um, and now this is the scariest thing to me, microplastics in the air, micro nanoplastics, I should say, since it's a spectrum of continual fragmentation, we're not calling them micro nanoplastics. So they are in the air and um, how do they get there? Well, 80% of them, and this is the weirdest thing you would never imagine, come from actually car tires. I was shocked to find out that car tires are actually made more of plastic than of rubber. Uh, brake pads and traffic just churning ground level microplastics up into the air and then sea spray 20%. <clears throat> I should say, uh, I want to say about the air, um, we're breathing a lot of um, micro nanoplastics. Um, recent studies showed that we're actually breathing more than we're eating and we're eating about a credit card's worth a day. Um, so we also have contamination of our land and soil. How does that happen? Well, air deposition, right? Because they're in the air, they're going to fall out of the air onto the ground, some of them. And then through these farming practices, which now that we know what we do about plastic, we're like, why are we doing this, right? I particularly want to point out the agrochemicals. They're in these controlled release capsules that are made of plastic. What happens uh, when our soil is contaminated? We kill things. I mean, quite bluntly, and we do it two ways, or the micro and nanoplastics do it two ways. There's a physical mechanical effect, plugging of the pores, of the plant roots, killing earthworms by digesting their digestive tract. And so you got to remember, these are fragments, right? Even though we call them particles, and in my head, I'm picturing something nice and round with smooth edge. These are fragments. These are things that have broken off. 
Um, and then there's poisoning because we know plastics are 10,000 chemicals. Um, and we'll talk more about um, another route of poisoning in a moment. Plastics threaten our food supply, right? So um, we know that uh, plastics kill earthworms. They also kill fungi. And you can see this is a picture of a terrestrial food web, a land-based food web, web, the animals that depend on earthworms and fungi. And then of course, those are called, um, they're considered decomposers. So they break down dead organisms and return the nutrients to the soil. So can you imagine having no earthworms or it doesn't even have to be, no, it has to be, if there weren't sufficient earthworms to perform these functions. Um, scientists have found plastics in every food that's been tested. And then all same thing happening in the aquatic uh, food web, um, poly or the um, zooplankton at the base of the food web eat the microplastic particles. You can see from the orange lines there, um, those are all the animals in water systems that depend on the zooplankton. And of course, we have um, micronanoplastics in our body. Basically, everywhere we've looked, we've found them. <clears throat> How do they get in there? It's kind of similar to plastic chemicals. And please excuse the poor quality of the slides. I've got to work on this. <laughs> the first is breathing, which I want to emphasize is the scariest thing to me because we are breathing such large quantities now. So you may remember that uh, when you're breathing, when you're taking air, travels down the main tube from your mouth that connects to the lungs called the bronchus. The bronchus then switches, uh, breaks up into two branches, one that goes into its tube, one that goes into the right lung, one that goes into the left lung. And then those tubes just uh, continue to divide and become smaller and smaller. It looks like an upside down tree. At the very ends of the trees, instead of leaves, we have alveoli, and they're thin-walled sacs, very thin-walled. I mean, they were designed that way so that gas, air that we breathe, can pass from the alveoli into the capillaries that surround those alveoli. And what this picture is attempting to show is that those particles, microplastic particles, the alveoli are so thin-walled that microplastic particles also can pass into the surrounding capillaries. Another route, digestive tract. So um, a digestive tract is also a very long tube uh, that can next your mouth to your anus and the tube just takes a long journey through that tube. And um, the inside of that tube is lined with cells. Those cells have little uh, villi on them that uh, beat and help move the food along the gastrointestinal tract. And that's what that first diagram is um, meant to show is the cells lining the lumen or the hollow part of the digestive tract. And you can see from that that the microplastic particles are too big to pass through or between the cells, but not the nanoplastic particles. They easily pass into the cells and then into the adjacent capillaries where they then are uh, go all travel all around the body. Um, this is skin. I haven't thought too much. I got to think more about the skin piece. This really has more to do, I think, with the personal care products. We know that um, the nanoplastics can penetrate any type of weakened skin barrier. So I want you to think sunburn and kids, you know, it can just be sunburn. Um, and the sunscreen that was in the plastic bottle. Oh, yeah. So uh, industry tells us, yeah, so what? No problem. We know we have these in our bodies. They don't harm us. Uh, so let's look at that. Uh, what are our data sources for microplastic? Um, these studies, we scientists get information from animal models, lots of them. I mean, and particularly rats and mice are used because their physiologic systems are really similar to those of humans. Um, then there's laboratory in vitro stuff, tissue cultures and cell samples. Those are the, the main uh, data from which we pull or the main um, methodologies that are used um, and we use the data. There appear to be two mechanisms of harm, <clears throat> um, mechanical or particle injury, the sharp edge fragments and the chemical poison injury. So the mechanical injury, you can imagine this is the first, the sharp end edged microplastics puncturing the cells. That was actually found in a study that was looking at uh, human cells uh, under a microscope, of course, in the, in the laboratory. Um, and they noticed that the sharper edged um, micro nanoplastics act, tend to act like pins and puncture and kill the cells. Um, these other two are from animal models um, where the um, 
particles wedge in between the cell membranes, basically stretches it so taut that it can't perform its functions and that kills the cell. And then finally, this seems to be probably the biggest pathway so far. Um, you can imagine a foreign body entering into a cell and the cell having an extreme inflammatory response so severe it uh, releases and it produces um, toxic chemicals thinking it's going to get rid of the invader but that the chemicals are the natural chemicals in the cell are so toxic inflammatory uh, chemicals kills the cell the other mechanism is poison. We, this should come as no surprise for you now. You should be like, of course there's going to be poison. We know that plastic contains 10,000 chemicals. You think that plastic is going to hold on to and not leak those chemicals? Well, what we know about plastic, right? It leaks. It leaks when there's a new water bottle that has not been weathered. These plastics in the environment that have now been reduced to micro nanoplastics, they've undergone so many weathering processes, they're extremely toxic, extremely leaky. Um, and then the other method of po poison I haven't talked too much about, because these are oily particles, we know they are plastic, right? The, the chemicals in the plastic. Remember that uh, chemistry principle, like attracts like, they're going to be attracted to other oily particles that are already in the environment. What are those? Those are persistent organic pollutants that are already in the environment, in the air, in the water, on land. Plastic acts like a sponge and soaks up those particles. And so when it enters the cells, it's delivery of poisons, poisons from within the plastic, poisons from without. So I hope you agree with me that we have an urgent and irreversible problem. Most of you here, I think, are familiar with this, and I know you're on, on board. What's the solution? So industry says, this is, I'm so sick of this, the recycling thing. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the recycling thing. So th this is what, you know, I know California is suing the, was well, investigating the plastic industry, ExxonMobil in particular, and um, this is uh, for false and misleading recycling claims, and it, it derives from the use of these symbols, which people just interpret as meaning a closed loop symbol, symbol, and actually from an earlier lawsuit in California, the plastic industry there is not even allowed to use what's called the chasing uh, the chasing arrows, they just use the triangle with a number in it, but they still, I think people still think that it's a closed loop system. So um, I'm hoping that uh, when you see these, this study, um, uh, and you, the first thing you should say to yourself, why only 9% of all plastics ever produced have been recycled? Why? Well, here's why. This is how they make plastic. <clears throat> so you'll see plastic is, uh, uh, comes in the form of pellets when it comes out of the refinery or factory and is loaded up into this little hopper here. These are little green pellets, so they have some colorant in them. And they travel along, it's a screw, a long horizontal uh, screw. And the screw turns and pushes the plastic pellets along that tube. While the plastic's moving along the tube, it's heated, so it becomes a molten. And then it's squeezed at the very end, they call the injection molding. You can see it kind of looks like a hypodermic needle injection. Injected into the mold, there it goes again. And then, and this is, uh, sped up, but the, then the plastic product uh, cools, the mold falls away, and then you have a product. Okay, let's see if I can get to the next one. So what would we'd like to do, right, in a closed loop system, we'd like to take that green product, and sorry about the quality of the slide, we'd like to take that green product when we're done using it and grind it up and feed it back into the hopper, right, and make another product. But we can't because when the plastic went through the production process the very first time, the heat and the compression irreversibly damaged that plastic polymer. Remember that long carbon hydrogen uh, chain that we started out the, the teach-in with? That chain has been irreversibly damaged from these production processes. So we cannot feed the new product back into the upper. If we tried to do that, by the time it got to the mold, the mold would fall away and we would have a brittle product. <clears throat> this is from a, uh, one of those engineering uh, journal uh, reports. I have a hard time getting the industry to, say, to find anything where they actually come out and say this. Um, 
So heat and compression degrade the polymer and that is irreversible. I like to think of this as like a over kneaded dough. I don't know if any of you make bread, but when you knead the flour, what you're doing is warming up. You're heating two flour proteins so they can react with each other and then they form long gluten strands. But if you do it too much, if you ever work the dough, the strands become, become so tight, they just break and tear under pressure. And this is irreversible. I think it's a really good um, analogy for plastic, what happens to plastic in the production process. Here's a second reason plastic is not recyclable. Well, what's in it? 10,000 plastic chemicals. They went through the whole production cycle, made our little plastic piece. But what happened to them when they went through the production cycle? We already know we're going to have non-intentionally added chemicals and uh, who knows what uh, weathering or what other things happen after that. But um, we now have this weird chemical mix. We don't even know what's in it. So there are three pl plastic uh, processing options, or I call them reprocessing options, that are referred to as recycling. I want you to be really clear that they're not recycling, and here's why. So first is downcycle after the polymer is super damaged. You can't make a bottle from it anymore, but you maybe can make a plastic bag. And imagine the reason that plastic bag is glowing, it's, a, a, it's super toxic. So that's plastic that's been processed twice, very leaky and very hazardous. It's gonna get used once and get thrown in landfill or environment. And this is really important. These products are not in demand. They're actually, the supply is in excess. We have, there's so much of these plastic bags around that they get dumped in developing countries. So it's not like you're saving a plastic bag from having to be made. You're not reducing virgin plastic demand. Same with post-consumer content. This is hot thing right now. Picture this though. Uh, our, our polymer is so damaged, we can't really make a product from it. We're going to have to add a lot of virgin plastic. And same thing, you're making an unnecessary product that's already overproduced. You're not reducing uh, plastic. And you're also making a kind of a hot product there, a very toxic product. And then finally, this is, of course, the latest thing. I know you're well aware uh, the industry totes uh, advanced recycling or upcycling. This is just burning or melting plastic in an incinerator-like facility. You can uh, Supposedly, you can burn this and recover energy, which means a low-grade fossil fuel, or you can burn it and you can recover the uh, plastic feedstock, although I just don't even see how that's possible. And to date, uh, what's shown is that neither of these um, processes have actually produced the the products that they promised. Uh, the other thing is really important. This is unregulated insulation. The uh, facilities that do this are labeled manufacturing uh, facilities, not incinerator facilities. So they're not, they don't have to follow the same um, incinerator pollution uh, regulations that incinerators have to follow. And they produce, of course, toxic ash and emissions. It's kind of a stealth way to dump plastic on the environment. And if you have any, uh, you know, reservations and doubt about the fact that plastic can be recycled, and, and you can tell your friends and family or anyone you're having this debate, compare the plastic process to metal, paper, and glass. And yeah, you know, no recycling is per uh, perfect. All recycling is going to require um, resources and going to produce at least so far greenhouse gases. Uh, but at least with metal, paper, and glass, we don't have the degradation of material from cycle to cycle. No 10,000 chemicals relatively long lived. And here it is, the campaign of deception. Yay, California. I'm glad California is represented here um, in the lead as always. And this is that investigation I mentioned against ExxonMobil for false and misleading advertising. So what can I do? What can all of us do? Four steps, but the very first one is to just think differently about plastic. Remember the ketchup bottle. Plastic is not your friend. It's a hazardous substance. Why would you choose a hazardous substance to serve food to your children or to yourself or to anybody? It's really important to change the way we think about plastic because the thinking determines how we message. The message shapes our action. Here's an example. Um, in 20... Um, was this 2021? Yeah, Can, uh, Canada la added plastic uh, into its list of toxic substances at the equivalent of its EPA. This basically allowed the government to regulate plastic. But just the fact that it gave it the designation of being uh, toxic is super important. Change the way people think about it. And then just recently, Canada begins a single-use plastic ban. ban. 
and it's phase out aspect here too. Here's another example of messaging. Uh, I hear this all the time. We cannot recycle ourselves out of this problem. I hate that message. I don't know, what's that supposed to be polite? Someone's afraid of stepping on toes or offending others. I mean, but really polite to who? The plastic industry? Whose toes? The plastic industry? You know, I think our friends and neighbors and our children, our parents deserve to know that they're being duped. The, the message is plastic is not recyclable. And why that is, you now know two reasons. The production processes, the heat and compression irreversibly degrade the polymer. You just can't make anything more from it. And the second is those 10,000 plastic chemicals contaminate the next round. Um, the second step is just to stop using plastic. And I'm sorry, I'm not gonna, I don't think it's a personal responsibility thing. I think it reflects the fact that you're thinking about plastic different. You're gonna wanna stop using it when you get to the thinking correctly about plastic. And also your actions do affect others. I wanted to show the little clip of that 2009 uh, guy at George Washington at the um, Sasquatch dance. He's out there dancing by himself all alone. And then after like 30 seconds, another person jumps in and 45, another person, you know, a, individual person's actions can make a difference. But I love using this framework. I'm going to come back to this. Uh, this is the way to start. Just first you look around what plastics are non-essential. And I love the definition of non-essential. These are plastics that only exist because of market opportunity. And that means the industry created the demand. We didn't demand these products. They created the demand for those products. And then you can see substitute Tutable products, they're important, but there are functionally equivalent alternatives. And then essential products, you know, these are things that are going to have to be replaced uh, because we cannot live with plastics, but we're going to have to think about it and invent stuff probably. And this is a big one, change food dispensing methods. We just can't have plastic in contact with our food. Um, and that requires rethinking our whole institutional uh, food uh, dispensing model from what I call the uh, fast food or vending machine model that's pushed by big egg and big food and relies on plastic. And it's a model of cheap and easy and convenient and non-nutritious food. We need to change that to healthy nutrition, nutritious food um, and, and build those care and relationships back into our food uh, dispensing. And then finally, we're looking at working at the legislative uh, level. You should take no answer except turn off the tap. This is an urgent problem. We do not have time to pussyfoot around and do a and make some incremental changes here and there. The, our legislators need to hear it. And if we're all constantly just won't let up, we need to be absolutely relentless. And we need to teach them about what plastic actually is. We can introduce them to the non-essential use framework and give them something to work with. Maybe they would want to hear, oh, banned plastic, but we're like, okay, here's some non-essential plastic. Let's start here. And this has already begun just this year, Indiana, uh, imposed a ban on July 1st. And it's so funny if you read the articles about this, the biggest brouhaha was about the straws. I thought of all things, um, Pepsi and Coke were furious about the straws. But um, fortunately, India persisted, and then Canada uh, plans to begin uh, phasing out starting in December. So it is possible. Um, thank you. And that's it. I'm open for questions. Hopefully, it won't take too long. Yeah, why don't we open it up to questions? Thank you so much, Jenny. That was so thank much you. information. And just judging from the chat, chat, the chat, it was very, very, people were really surprised and illuminated and everybody was bringing yeah really you're getting lots of kudos i hope you're um reading the chat because um it's we'll save it for you so you can go through it later too okay. if you want. um so does anybody have any questions yeah someone says it'll be ben says it'll be worth a few listens because it's it was very dense lots and lots of material to, to listen to i really appreciate the way you broke down the scientific information for us so that we could really follow along. Okay, Rahana, is that how you say your name? Um, oh. It's Rachna. Rachna, okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi, um, thanks. Thanks for that wonderful um, and information dense presentation. Um, I wanted to ask, I've heard that durable plastics will play an important part in the transition. Um, and especially with the, like using them in refill situations as well. But given what you've said, it seems like maybe that's not a good idea, but glass is so heavy and transporting it. So 
What do you say about durable um, plastic and use and and how it can help get us off single use plastic? Yeah, well, you know, you live in the ideal world and you don't have uh, constraints, those constraints of budget and heaviness and transportation issues. Uh, you would choose glass or stainless steel or ceramic. Um, I was in China just in like a, the 1990s and they were still porting food by putting it into a ceramic bowl, covering with a ceramic plate, tying a cloth around it, which I still do actually. So it's lovely. So yeah, in an ideal world, that's what you're going to do for obvious reasons. I actually think reusable plastics are more toxic than single use plastics because mm. of the weathering and the leakiness that happens. Um, so um, I... I totally resist that message that reusable plastics is going to have to be part of the transition that comes from the plastic industry. They will do anything they can to prevent us from turning off the tap. Um, given that, I understand the real, real world constraints and just um, encourage people to do the best they can. But people don't need to go out and buy fancy stuff. You could, as I said, use a, I use a canning jar right? The ball canning jar. And I use that for drinks and for food. There, there are ways to do it, even though it's a little bit heavier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, Sharon, you ask next, and then I have to remember to ask something from Adalia after. Go ahead, Sharon. Hi, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, I was concerned with our intake personally of nano plastics and wondering, since we live in New York City, um, I don't know. I don't know what the latest water reports are for New York's waterways and the drinking water we get. Um, but should we all be installing filtration systems and uh, as well as air filters? And if so, what are the best systems to use? Up to your knowledge. Yeah, that's a big uh, question. I don't think I'm qualified to answer. What are the best systems to use? Hmm. But uh, what do we know about nanoplastics? My, uh, I'm uh, really concerned about air intake now. Um, we know um, that we're taking in a huge number of nanoplastics when we breathe. We know that there's, uh, they're more highly concentrated in urban areas. I haven't read anything about New York City uh, specifically, but it's an urban area. And um, so we know that the concentration is going to be higher there than in a rural area, for example. The upside is that when you live in a uh, metropolitan area, it's a lot more regulated. Um, there are a lot of reasons to have water filters. Uh, there's lead pipes and buildings and all kinds of things. So, um, you know, so there's a lot of really good reasons to have uh, water filters. Or your water's probably regulated a lot better than it is out in some rural um, county. Um, so yeah, I think we all have to do the best we can. I read these studies every day and sometimes I get into our group meeting, I'm just almost on the verge of panic um, because these are big problems and that's what's behind the urgency. And that's why I really emphasize no incremental change. I mean, if that's what you gotta have, you gotta have, but we gotta just keep pushing on our legislation. We need big, big change fast. Is there any place you would suggest we go for recommendations for those systems? That no, I'm just not qualified to answer that. I know. Um, no, I, I don't. I can't answer that. But I'm going to research it now that I. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I, know, I can speak with you offline about it too. I, I have my own ideas, but I don't want to endorse anything. And I have, sure. I have mine too, because we do have air filters, because we get the forest fires here. Um, and we have water filters, but I just would not be comfortable recommending a particular brand. So. Okay. Great. Thanks, Sharon. Um, Adalia, do you want to ask your question or do you want me just to at, ask it out? Okay, I'm going to ask it, but just butt in if you want. Um, what got you interested or introduced you to the plastic problem? I don't know. Somebody asked me that the other day. And, you know, I, I was a doctor for a while. That's how I met Debbie Leash. Uh, she was my patient. I was her doctor. And um, was I obsessed about plastics even then? I can't remember. Chemicals. I Even back in the 90s, it was a thing for me. And then I raised three kids. I think that's when you really start to be, because uh, you don't, you want to protect your children. I really care about myself, but really more, much more picky about my kids. And um, I think in the 90s, all this information started coming out about bisphenols and even PFAS back then. Um, so it just was slowly, and then it, the thing about plastic is it's just like weird as 
heck. I mean, I once I started realizing how toxic it was, I just I couldn't understand why it wasn't just obvious to people um, and why, you know, I thought, oh, good, we've got all these studies happened in the mid 90s about bisphenols and PFAS. That's going to be great. We're going to turn the corner and then just the waste issue, right? Use it once and throw it away. It's, what's that all about? So the whole thing has just been I'm perplexed, you know? Yeah. Um, um, Oliver has a question. Thank you, Hi. Oliver. Hi. Thank you. And, and thanks, Jenny, for a great presentation. Um, I, I wondered, I, I saw you cite the study at the beginning, um, which I haven't read on um, what's happened to all the plastic that's ever been made and that, that pie chart, which was cool. Um, did the study give any attempt at a figure for how much of the plastic is still in use currently? Yeah. So, well, yeah. So everything's still in use. Well, in use, no. Um, no, it didn't. Uh, we we know that a bunch is sitting in the landfill we, uh, and a bunch is in the environment. No, that's probably, that's about as granular as they got with that study. I, I kind of, in my mind, picture that the incinerated stuff is gone, right? The stuff that's supposedly recycled, what they call recycled, I remember I didn't follow up with that. When you go back and look at that study, it says that only 0.9% of all plastics that were produced have been recycled more than once. So what that tells you is it's the downcycling, um, they mislabeled it. But um, yeah, so I, I think that the incinerated stuff is in a different place, different form, but all the other stuff's still here with us in one form or the other. I don't know how much has been used. Thank you. Great. But that's a, that's a study to cite. Everyone turns to that one, right or wrong. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? A couple of hands up. Okay. Um, how about Ben? Uh, yeah. Great presentation, Jenny. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about. Uh, the environmental justice impact of frontline communities near plastic factories and the like. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you for that, Ben, absolutely. So uh, we talked about how plastic is made and let's just start there. Um, you know, I had this really cute little thing with linking together the little ethane molecules like the beads on a necklace. Well, it's a really ugly, heavily polluting process with all kinds of incredibly toxic byproducts like benzene and stuff. All of these plants are cited in um, marginalized communities and low income communities and communities, people of color historically and ongoing that has not changed. And then all the, uh, any, any of these industrial pieces that are uh, part of this plastic process, they're all cited in this name. And these recycling facilities, you'd imagine recycling or at least downcycling uh, plastic. These are highly toxic products and they release those toxins to the environment. And again, they're usually cited in the same areas. Um, yeah, and I, I just wanna step in and say that um, legislation that, addresses turning off the tap like you mentioned and also that helps to encourage a higher capture rate so that it doesn't end up what what they do what is produced doesn't end up out in the environment is our best bet at least to begin with that's our first like broad stroke we have to do and also eliminate chemicals from the toxins from the plastic that known chemicals that i will say is what New York State's latest um, extended producer responsibility bill does, which if everyone knows extended producer responsibility, they have it for many other um, items like mattresses or carpets in some places, but they have it now for paper and packaging uh, that they're proposing in New York State. The first bill that was proposed was not great. It didn't identify toxins and it also left producers in charge. Um, this problem that we have that Jenny just outlined happened with producers in charge, so we don't we don't want that to, to continue. Um, but extended producer responsibility, we're about to look at that now and all of the swabs the, at the bill more closely, but it's addressed all of these issues th that we had with the first bills that were brought up. So that and also the bigger, better bottle bill, which encourages a capture rate of bottle bill states with bottle bills have about a 70% capture rate on those materials, those those bottles that have deposits on them, as opposed to like in New York City, for instance, 
I think it's about a 15% capture rate on most plastics and you know most recyclables with compared to the 70% capture rate on the bottle bill. So these kinds of um, these kinds of legislative pieces, what you're saying is that legislation is really the only thing. There was a piece that Debbie Lee shared yesterday on Twitter, um, and I can't remember her name. She did a speak, a, a talk today from The Guardian, where she talked about uh, the plastics industry really taking advantage of the COVID crisis. And um, it speaks wonderful truths um, in the book. Oh, good. I think Debbie Lee. Anyway, that is um, super um, informative when it's talking about, you know, what, what the industry sort of, what their tactics are. Um, but the, in, in it, they disclose that um, someone in the industry just discloses the only thing that's going to get them to stop making so much plastic is war or laws. So hello legislation i'm ready for that um okay i i will um sharon has another question hi um so i remember hearing recently of a university lab that has developed um some enzymes that eat plastic but they're also and i was looking it up in the interim there are also bacteria mushrooms um other enzymes that occur naturally microbes and even the evolution of certain animals, mealworms and wax worms that are evolving to digest plastic. Um, what do you say about any of that? And do you know more than my brief, you know, Google search um, talking about that? Because it sounds very exciting and promising, um, but I, I don't know what the state of the art is or what the future looks like for using those types of organisms to um, introduce them into plastic rich environments or waterways or even air um, to take out some of those nanoplastics that you were talking about. Yeah, thanks Sharon, that's um, so glad you brought that up. So uh, notice how much attention those articles get. We should have attention about what the existential crisis that's being posed to all being in that we're all participating in we're kind of locked in this thing and um that's where all the attention should be but it's just amazing to me every day right i see those articles too one or two at least every single day um getting a lot of play you'd think that that'd be our you know miracle solution um and i just want to remind you that the plastic industry just like the tobacco industry is well aware of these kind of psychological tendencies that we all have we we you know getting rid of plastic is going to be really really painful and uh, we were addicted to plastic and we are all addicted and dependent on plastic that's the way it is and the industry is well aware of that and uh so by it wants to give us a solution that we can uh, hold on to and uh while keeping the tap open right so um i want you to think of it in two pieces and it's, it reminds me of uh, climate change right even if we turned off plastic today even if we turned off all greenhouse gases today we still have an enormous problem i mean huge so like how many worms do you think we're gonna need to clean up all the plastic that we've created the billions of tons of plastic that now exist. I mean, I don't care if you're, you know, you can spend your lifetime creating and propagating worms and enzymes and mushrooms. It's not, it's a drop in the bucket compared to everything. And I'm, I welcome those solutions because at least it's something. But I want to always make sure you keep your eye on the tap. Of course. Right? So turn off the damn tap bring on the mushrooms and the earthworms. I'm all for, uh, you know, nature-based solutions. So that in general. Now, the other thing I want you to do is use common sense. I just told you what plastic is made out of. What kind of earthworm is going to be, or what kind of worm, mealworm, I think you mentioned, what kind of worm is going to be able to survive 10,000 chemicals? I just, I read these things and I'm like, really? And what were you testing? Were you just testing the polymer? Or were you testing the whole plastic package, which is the polymer plus the 10,000 chemicals? So that's also where that inert thing comes from. We, we know, or 
this is what I understand, and I don't know if this is true or not, and I'm always skeptical about everything, that the, the, just the plain polymer, the polyethylene, that carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen long chain, and the polypropylene polymer may well be inert. I mean, they're huge molecules, so they may not affect our biological systems. They may just pass right through our body, but that's a problem. Plastic is not just the polymers. You got all these other things with it, too, so keep that in mind. Just use your common sense. What do I know plastic is? This just sounds like weird as hell. If it works, great. But what about the tap? Right. right. And Ben, oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry. And then, and then the other thing I would add to this part of the conversation is I, and I even sent uh, a couple of videos to Matt this afternoon about the uh, labs that are working on biodegradable, uh, nature born plastic replacements like uh, Chittisan and Chitin that um, can mimic pl what plastic does in many different forms. Um, how much hope do you have for that to replace the plastic tap as we turn it off? Yeah, well, we're gonna need some of that because we can get rid of those non-essential items. I, I would refer back to that framework, that regulatory framework. We can get rid of non-essential items. We can get rid of substitutable items, but we have some essential products like our phones, for example, um, that we don't have that are essential and are not substitutable. So we're gonna need something to substitute that. We, we can't live with plastic, it's just killing us. Um, so that's the first thing. Now, it's really important to examine exactly what these substitutions are. Some of them supposedly biodegradable, actually all they do is break the plastic into smaller pieces faster. And so there may be some alternative components, bamboo, quinoa, you know, plant-based components, but there's also a lot of times, if you read the label really carefully, mm -hmm. there's also polymer in there as well. Mm -hmm. So, well, so well, look carefully and see what the thing is actually made of. And then the, finally, sometimes to get that product to function, they still have to add a bunch of chemicals. Yeah, and can I just add in here, and that's another thing that I like about, I feel like this is a word from our sponsor, but it's not our sponsor, um, but I keep bringing it in, that the EPR bill in New York State also identifies chemicals to eliminate to toxins that are toxins, known toxins, there's about 14 of them, and those same chemicals are used for bioplastics as well. So they're used to make it a shape, to make it a color, to make it not brittle, to make it, you know, squeezy or not squeezy, whatever it is. And those chemicals, as we shift, as we might think shifting to bioplastics is a good idea, then those chemicals would also be forbidden um, for, um, for those, for that new solution so that we're not I mean, obviously there's going to be problems that we don't foresee as we try to transition out of this problem, but that helps avoid something that we know would be a problem coming down. Yes, and those chemicals are even more dangerous because they come in a product that appears to be natural or non-harmful. Yeah. So people are not likely to dispose of them properly. Right, right. I also wanna add in, Ben also said about those um, microorganism eating um, entities what comes out the other side of them once it's digested. So are they fully processing it and making it just disappear or? Right, what? we know that's not true. Matter is neither created nor destroyed, right? So. Um. We're coming to the end of this. This is, this is amazing. There were so many great links shared. We can actually, when we send the, the, the follow-up for this, the follow-up email, we can share some of these links that folks shared. And, um, uh i guess that's it do you have anything to say debbie lee or jenny just to say thank you so much to everybody for coming thank you jenny i feel like we're going to need a sequel there's so obviously jenny packs so much in and i have a few people direct message saying you know i couldn't get it all and i've heard her talk many times already and i still need to hear it again there's still a lot of new things so um so we should think about you know what, what's the next talk um, what comes after this and of course also amplifying this talk that jenny mm. gave tonight thank you so much jenny yeah. and thank, thank you to you. the swabs for hosting thank absolutely. you absolutely i'm so honored to be here you you all do such amazing work in a a huge metropolitan area i can't imagine how you the waste uh mechanisms you have in place to to <laughs> manage that it's got to be incredibly complex <laughs> yeah, thank it's you very complex <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you so, so much. So thanks everyone. for everybody from all across the globe. Really nice to have everybody here and to chat with some of you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. And if you if you haven't signed on to uh, or follow Cafeteria Culture on our social media, um, so that um, at cafeteriaculture.org, you can follow us on social media if you want to know when we have our next talk. Thank you so much, Oliver. You weren't introduced as the chair of Brooklyn Swab. I, I did introduce him. Oh, you chair. did. Oh, yes. I couldn't remember. And L'Oreal, yeah. was she introduced? Also yes, L'Oreal. Mm -hmm. okay, and also sure. Liz and Great. Debbie's here, who Joyce. is the secretary. Um, and yes, and Joyce and Sharon and Vondra's here. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks Thank everyone you so for coming. Much, Brooklyn Thank and you, Jenny. Swabs. Thank you for hosting. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank for you, coming. everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Oh, wow.